Thanks. It's, it's great to be back. The film we just saw quite logically focuses on death and life, which <coughs> is Jane's most influential book by a huge margin. Um, but she wrote several other books over the course of her life, which are not nearly as recognized. And in one of them, she speaks about something she calls the monstrous hybrid. And the monstrous hybrid is the uh, partnership, these public-private partnerships on which we build so much of our infrastructure today. She feared collusion. She feared self-dealing. She saw it in, uh, you know, in everything that Moses did in urban renewal. But how do, as we face uh, an infrastructure bill, how now do we go forward without these? I mean, it's inconceivable to build the kind of country we want, we want to build now without the input of uh, big real estate interests. So what can we take away and what can we, how do we proceed and go forward and absorb her lessons and, and what we do know about what works? Well, I think the, in their current bizarre political situation um, where we have a government that we don't even executive branch, we can't quite even figure out what it is yet, uh, run by a former real estate developer um, who, uh, when he's, whenever he's embraced by the opposition party, which is increasingly rare, is when he talks about infrastructure. And then, you know, the leadership of, in Congress says, oh, we can really work with him on infrastructure. Uh, before the inauguration, I was having uh, a meeting with a real estate developer about another film project entirely, and he excitedly said, oh, I've just come from breakfast with all of my um, real estate developer buddies. And they said, hey, hey, uh, <laughs> Trump just called us. You want to get in on a bridge deal? <laughs> uh, and I was like, my god, he isn't even inaugurated yet. Uh, it's like the worst Jane Jacobs nightmare. But this was <laughs> primary. Right, I mean, right, right, really right, was, right, they, right. These guys had, it was in Miami. It was kind of like, um, I don't know, it was like all little very insidery developer -y world, and they had heard directly from uh, the president-elect about doing this, and I thought, well, there goes the whole altruism of, uh, you know, rebuilding our airports and um, criticizing the decaying infrastructure of our country, which we all notice every day. Anyone who's gone to an airport in, you know, Europe, right. come back and land at JFK or LaGuardia, even worse, and you're just, you know, it's so demoralizing. So I think Trump was getting a lot of mileage out of that, but what I saw from that moment and having read my Jacobs is this is uh, beware of this. Uh, I think uh, obviously Trump is being accused of uh, collusion uh, in a foreign policy sense, but I think that uh, the so-called infrastructure bill, which probably will never happen in the foreseeable future, uh, it seems to be a really dangerous collusionary thing, which gets good press, which I think is the most dangerous part of it, of it all. And, and yet, <clears throat> in some ways, you know, you look around the city and lots of the infrastructure uh, and lots of the dynamic of the city are privately owned. And right, so right. the question is how not to shun that, but to right. do it in an inclusive and integrated way um, and, and to demonstrate what the value in working in that way is. And uh, we were approached by a developer that is bidding to redevelop the Milan Expo site. Mm -hmm. um, and they are seeing, and I won't name who it is because the bids aren't awarded yet, but they're starting to see the value in thinking about that site, which is a huge parcel of land pretty close to downtown Milan in, in right. Italy, um, and, and thinking about all the adjacencies and what it can do, not just for that site, but how it can help make the city a more vibrant, livable, sustainable place. Um, and that kind of enlightened self-interest can be really powerful because you don't need to per persuade bureaucrats or um, yeah, power brokers uh, to do something, but rather have the private sector see it as part of their core interests. Right. I mean, there's a term uh, called value capture, and it refers to really what, how developers can create projects, towers, and really add value to real estate drive up prices when there are parks and big infrastructure projects. And that's obviously, that value capture mentality is something we have to right. move past. I want to uh, get back, return to the film, and play devil's advocate a little bit. What, you know, uh, Jane Jacobs is completely lionized, sanctified right now. Many of you have probably seen 
t-shirts on young people that say <laughs> less, Jane, less Mark Jacobs, <laughs> more Jane Jacobs, not really sure who Jane Jacobs is. What did, she, what did she get wrong? She got some, you know, there's a lot of talk, uh, certainly a lot of reflection. Matt and I have argued about this on a stage before, that she, in death and life, would, really was blind to the issue of race. She had an editor say, please, you know, deal with the issue of race, and she dealt with it in a few sentences, uh, not in any substantial way. Why do you think that it is, and what should we think about that now when we think about her? Uh, I, I disagree that she was blind to it. I think she wanted to not focus on race, but wanted to focus on um, the, uh, the issue at hand, which was she felt the topic of her book. Uh, the East Harlem was, as you see in the film, uh, really where uh, the revelation came to her. And uh, she um, says in Death and Life that uh, the, the uh, segment of the population most put upon by urban renewal, uh, referring to East Harlem, uh, is the African American population. Uh, then she doesn't do a chapter on it, it is true. Uh, her editor at the time, uh, there's correspondence that says, uh, upon consideration, I think you should really address the Negro question. This is, dates it, of course, to the 1950s. Um, so uh, she felt, well, I, I don't want to do a chapter on race. I want to do a chapter on the, the larger uh, issue of uh, city building and rebuilding. And if it affects uh, vulnerable minorities, uh, no matter what race they are, that's, that's how the lens that I'm going to look at it through. That's certainly the defense of her. Right. Mindy, Mindy Fully Love, who's uh, in the movie, is a, a research psychiatrist and sociologist. I, I was concerned about this, and uh, she wrote a book called Root Shock, uh, mm -hmm. which deals with this question, and she feels, she's one of the people that uh, is a defender of Jacobs uh, along those lines. Uh, for the film itself, uh, I was just, uh, I wanted to do a section on pruitt Igo, and I yeah. wanted to put the James Baldwin line in there, which I, I didn't realize he had said on film, I was so happy to find that, where his, one of, his immortal aphorisms is urban renewal is Negro, Negro removal. removal. Uh, and he, he did indeed say it on, on film. Um, and uh, I think that's very important for everyone to hear uh, still to this day. Absolutely. Michael? Uh, it's not exactly the question you're asking, but one thing that Matt and I were talking about backstage, which is interesting, is that in, in some ways we see the pendulum swinging too far in terms of uh, the local control over decisions. Absolutely. And, I, yes. And, and some people and, would say New York community boards almost have too much power because you can't build up, which would ultimately create more affordable housing, right? And, That's an argument. And I can think of a number of Western cities and communities using some of these local uh, powers in terms of nimbyism. There was a big ballot measure that was defeated in Los Angeles this last election cycle right. that would have neutered the ability of the city to really impact some of the key issues that it's wrestling with. So um, thinking about how that pendulum swings, so you get both you know, a, con you know, a coordinated regional effort that's able to account for all the dynamics of the city and yet local voices. That's the two uh, values you need to hold at the same time. Exactly. Um, the film takes an obviously extremely critical view of public housing, the way it played out. We see the destruction of all of these failed projects. There's a wonderful documentary, by the way, about Pruitt-Igo, mm -hmm. Pruitt-Igo project. Uh, we've had some more success in other cities in, uh, here in New York, and you know, for a, for some time, uh, they were really engines of success and, and, and upward mobility. And you have people like Lloyd Blankfein, you know, growing up in a project in East New York. So uh, a lot of the issue really is that the feds pulled out, right? We have white flight. I mean, it isn't all about the design. We have white flight. We have the federal government divesting uh, when things start to fall apart. And, but but you, you take, I think, it's fair to say, a, a, a view that it really was, as Jacob said, design related. I think it had a lot to do with it. I think everything's case by case. Uh, Jacobs would be the first to say that nothing's cookie cutter and you can't look at the world in a monolithic way. So in certain places, that kind of uh, institutional modernism worked better than other places. In some places, it was better integrated. Uh, Lafayette Park in Chicago, which was designed by mm -hmm. Mies van der Rohe, uh, is uh, one of the few success stories in this country. Um, 
uh, uh, what would be called super block modernism. Uh, I think that uh, the reason I made the movie was I think if we understand the, the foundational material and the history of this, then we can all look at our cities and be our own Jane Jacobses and, and affect greater change. Uh, there's no recipe book uh, to changing your city, but understanding some fundamentals certainly does help and I think would actually solve some NIMBY problems because I think a lot of NIMBYism comes from a place of maybe good intention, but also right. not deep study. And certainly you can't accuse Jan Jacobs of not being an empiricist and a studier and a, and a very brilliant person. And I think if uh, <coughs> people worked as hard as she did, uh, we'd all be better off probably. Uh, and we wouldn't have as much nimbyism that was uh, unintentionally destructive. Uh, I think that um, the, the, what I would say the takeaway from the housing portion of the film is in my opinion, and probably in my opinion should be, uh, <laughs> is that uh, anything uh, formally or financially uh, uh, that destroys social capital, I think, is a negative, frankly. And I think that was really Jacobs's point. Uh, it's very possible that she coined the term social capital, and she saw cities as social capital engines, which is a really, really brilliant way to look at cities. And that may be her, one of her greatest gifts to us. So if the form, and super block modernism, I would argue, tends to do this, tends to eradicate social capital, which would be like, you know, like eyes on the street is the kind of really great example of that because those tall buildings uh, and er eradication of the sidewalk culture kind of killed social capital, then I think you're in a really bad place. Architecture can do that. Uh, right. Of course, it's a much more complicated equation. And I would say the, uh, the flip side of that is the big opportunity with all of the infrastructure that we need to build right. because of climate change or, or because of you know, the expanding urban footprint around the world. We heard uh, a city the size of LA built every couple of months. Right. You know, a million people right. a week is another way to think about it, moving into cities around the world. If we think about infrastructure as not only accomplishing what it set out to do, whatever that Build, thing is, right. flood control, mobility, whatever, but also think about it, how it builds social capital. And to give you a good example, you know, the Dutch in Rotterdam struggling with water. Kimmelman just did a nice piece on this in the, in the mm -hmm, Times. Mm -hmm. um, but thinking about water infrastructure also to build social capital to help new migrants to Rotterdam and to the Netherlands adjust and assimilate. You know, a water park that holds thousands of gallons of water when it's wet, but for the 350 some odd days a year that it's not wet, right. in, even in Rotterdam, uh, it serves as a five-a-side soccer pitch, it serves as community theater, it's a place to mingle and, and to build this social capital. If we do that, then we get double bang for our buck with all the infrastructure we build, and that's what's gonna make our city stronger. Right. And from my perspective, ultimately more resilient. Uh, Stephen Johnson hits on it in the film. Right. He talks about, the in Jacobs too, when she talks about messiness and people wanting a big cleanup, uh, and those messy people tend to be vulnerable minority communities, frankly. Exactly. Uh, so there was a lot that was gotten away with uh, in the name of a cleanup, which sounds good on paper, but yeah. uh, this is a recurring right. problem, certainly. It, it, it's interesting from a global perspective, a lot of our developing you know, global south cities, uh, mm -hmm. the Lagoses and the Nairobis and uh, Jakartas are, are struggling with these issues now. Mm -hmm. um, because you have f poor informal settlements in incredibly right. vulnerable areas the on favelas, riverbeds, right. on the favelas, on the mountainsides. Um, and how do you balance this line between just a cleanup that makes no sense and improvements that are absolute, uh, absolutely essential given right. climate change and everything else that's going on. Right, and, and, and are we seeing um, a, a movements abroad against this unchecked, untrammeled growth of these high rises? everywhere, which you so, 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 so vividly at the end of the film. Well, unfortunately, in China, um, <laughs> it's so obviously a bit top down there. Uh, it's very hard to affect change. Uh, the government is the developer. Right. Uh, now, on the other hand, it's been pointed out that if the government uh, saw uh, the light and wanted to affect change in uh, the other direction, they could do it very quickly, and it could be quite extraordinary. And there have been some faints uh, and certainly announcements to that effect and yeah. uh, there's been some building to that effect. India, there are movements in India. Uh, we did research and some shooting in Dharavi, which is the um, so-called 
largest slum, so-called slum in the global, in the world, I think, uh, and I th has uh, the largest social capital per capita in uh, India. <laughs> it's a very productive place. Uh, I was also astonished uh, in northern India, uh, an ex-Peace Corps person took me to something that was called Sites and Services. Were you aware of that? Um, Sites and Services was a World Bank program in the 60s that uh, gave building materials and uh, utility hookups to communities and then let people build incrementally. Uh, right. And it was quite successful. Uh, however, uh, it failed, I was told, that because no one could figure out how to make money out of it <laughs> and it wasn't scalable, they said, right. which is the question of our time, right. the scalability. So we're back, went back to the value capture. Right. Uh, that wraps it up for this panel part of the evening, but please join us for cocktails and merriment outside. Thank you, gentlemen.